The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew, welcome back to the show. Thanks again. Today, we're talking dividend investing, and this follows on from our passive income series, but it's actually something separate. Um, We did the top five Australian shares ETFs a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, and now we're we're doing a similar conversation, but for dividend investing or like yield investing. And the reason why is um, I received a few emails saying that we should do this for an income focus. Uh, we talked about the Vanguard VAS ETF, VanEck Equal Weight MVW, and a few other ETFs in that conversation. Um, we have touched on Vanguard VHY, which is the high yield Australian shares ETF from Vanguard. It's the biggest uh, dividend focus ETF in Australia. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the other ETFs that are available. But then we'll also talk about um, one that you're bringing to the conversation, which is a Plato fund. Um, first up, maybe what we can talk about is the, I guess, the differences when you are investing for yield in funds versus the, I guess, just the vanilla index funds and the kind of experience that you get. For example, Drew, people are often surprised that the value of their investment sometimes goes sideways or falls when the market is going up. Yep. Why does that happen? I think well, I'll say this is a a topic that's close to my heart in in dividends being you know retiree client base everyone wants high income and they want the income to match what they're pulling out but the the difficulty of investing solely for dividends is that you're investing in company if you're just investing in high dividend paying stocks you tend to be investing into companies that are paying out all their profit in the form of dividends mm. and naturally if a company isn't in, in reinvesting in themselves and they think there's more value sending the money out they're less likely to be able to grow like other companies. I mean, there's there's charts showing Telstra versus CSL. So CSL reinvests about a billion dollars a year in R&D and Telstra pays out about 90% of their income. Both have a role, but that's I think that's a key reason. Mm. 
Mm. And I think um, what tends to happen too is people, when they use these funds, they don't always use the dividend re- reinvestment plans that are available. So sometimes if you're in a fund and you're distributed uh, capital gains or something like that, um, you may end up with a declining net asset value in the fund. Um, and at the end of the year, ETF investors uh, get a, a member statement or like an annual tax report that's sent, which is helpful because then they can break down the different sources of income. Um, it's important to remember too that when we invest in these types of products, you still get franking credits if you're if the fund holds the position for long enough. But there are taxable events that happen inside the funds that people should be aware of. I think that's a unique thing as well that. Uh, just because you're getting dividends doesn't mean they're buying and holding those dividend stocks and holding them for 10 years. Mm. In a lot of cases, there's quite a lot of portfolio turnover. So mm. when you get that distribution, you'd assume it would be you know 90% dividends and franking. A lot of the time, it's realized capital gains mm. uh, that are being paid out. And that's part of that discussion around why the unit price stays flat as well. The, yeah. the nature of these trusts is they have to pay out every dollar of profit every year. Mm. And um, I think uh, I showed in a, a discussion that I had recently that if you didn't if you didn't include the dividends that you'd received from Australian shares, I think that's about four out of every $10 is dividends. And then if you include franking credits, which often aren't captured in any of the indices, there are a couple from S&P, um, that's maybe an extra 2% return per year. So you add all of that up and all of a sudden the income component for Australian investors plays a huge role in the returns that investors get. So um, maybe what we can do, mate, is this Plato fund is different. I haven't actually looked at this fund before. So I'm going to be led by you here uh, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about it and then who it suits. Yeah, no problem. So I think Plato is someone we stumbled on probably a decade ago, mm-hmm. um, as we as we tend to do. Yep. Uh, it's, I think they're, they're quite rare in, in finance and investment that they have a very specific focus and their website makes it clear they're focused on zero tax investors, so retirees, superannuation funds or low tax paying investors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're basically committed uh, with, I think, 10 or 15, 20 years worth of experience only investing in dividend paying stocks hmm. uh, or companies that have got increasing frank credit balances that they expect to pay dividends or make buybacks. So it's very, very targeted. Uh, and essentially, they hold anything from, I think they say 50 to 120 stocks, usually about 50 or 60, mm-hmm. that uh, either the highest paying dividend stocks at the moment, historically, but also forward looking, looking to grow their dividends as well. And so this is listed on the ASX under the ticker symbol PL8, yep. as in plate. <clears throat> Um, it's the Income Maximizer Limited. So it's an actively managed fund. It's diversified portfolio of Aussie shares. Uh, I think I've spoken to these guys via email a few times and that was it was clear that that was the focus. At the time, I was like, yeah, but everyone's interested in growth investing. So I don't know about this, but... Um, yeah, Don yeah. Hampson, so Dr. Yeah. Don Hampson is probably one of the more impressive investors you'll mm-hmm. see. Just the, the amount of... It's a data-driven strategy. So the amount of data they have on companies analyzing dividend payers and only they've got a global fund but are very much focused on australia mm-hmm. um i think it's a is it still an listed investment company yeah. as it stands yeah, yeah which is quite unique in if if you've done a session on listed investment companies they they got the ability to keep paying consistent dividends from their own franking reserves compared to etfs yeah. they just pay everything out um, that makes them a bit more controlled too um because yeah. Yeah, they can smooth the investment experience, but the key is that the net asset value and the stock price can sometimes be disconnected. Yeah, and I think one of the the reason they're focused on a zero tax, so uh, it's been popular with my clients that are retirees uh, mm. and holding within an SMSF, is that they are able to turn the portfolio over more aggressively. So they might hold, say, 50% of their portfolio stable. They might have things like CSL that you never have in a dividend-paying portfolio, but then combine that, like at the moment, they've got super retail group, JB Hi-Fi, these things that are yielding 8 to 10%, and you're turning over a portion of your portfolio for the upcoming dividend payments and making sure you get the frame credits as well. Mm. So it's kind of a, a combination of both, hopefully, some growth and income. Well, this is the difference here too. Um, whereas if you're in accumulation mode where your tax rate is 30 40 45%, whatever, yep. um, a higher tax rate can hurt. Uh, more turnover can result in you paying more tax yep. ordinarily. So that can hurt, particularly if you're in an ETF where it's just flow through straight back to you as an investor. But in an invest- listed investment company, it's also not too bad because it's tied up in the company's own tax rate. 
Yeah, definitely. I think it's always, at least they're, they're open on that, that if you're holding this in a taxable environment, you're going to get a reasonable capital gains tax um, mm. uh, bills each year because of the, the turnover and the distributions they're making. So whereas a lot of it's hard to determine from each individual strategy whether that's going to be the case or not. Yeah, and sometimes this is where we rely as investors or as financial advisors do at least rely on the um – I guess the the research reports that come from ratings houses, yeah, because then they can, using their experience, have somewhat of a prediction around what this might or might not do in terms of the taxable position. So this is a, a listed investment company. If I'm not mistaken, they also have the unlisted versions as well. Yep. Yeah. And so what do you find that you're primarily using for your clients? Uh, depends on whether there's a discount or a premium on the listed investment company. We tend to prefer. Uh, the unlisted version, just be, we can control redemptions and applications better and you don't have that risk of it going to more of a discount or more of a premium. Yep. Uh, so that's generally been our preference and it's the same portfolio, the same strategy that's, that lies behind it. So Yeah, right. So um, this is a really interesting one, the Plato Australian Shares Income Fund. In our Q&A session for the Passive Income Series, we had a few questions about how do you find funds. Well, here's another one that you can add to your list. I think last time we talked about the beta shares, um, EINC, the uh, Martin Curry yep. uh, listed fund as well. Yep. So that's another one that people can put on their watch list. So if this fund is more primarily focused, you know, there's a part of the portfolio that's turning over a lot, w- would you use this fund in an accumulator's portfolio or would you use something else typically? I think it's more suited to superannuation at least yep. uh, super, so 15% tax rate. Yep. Uh, preferably pension and we kind of see it not necessarily as a core but as a uh, complement to your core Aussie equity exposure where if you feel like you need more income over a period or you think dividend paying stocks are going to be in favour then you, you yep. tilt towards something like this. Okay and so I guess outside of this then actually one more question on this um, when you so, so say that you came across Plato 10 years ago but let's say you came across a new fund today like this one how would you go about researching this fund? Uh, just multiple meetings with the portfolio managers is always a start and research reports, as yep. you suggested. So we get approached all the time to, to look at strategies. Um, one, we kind of make a call on whether we're looking for that type of exposure within a portfolio. Is, is dividend income or is growth, fast-growing tech companies, is that what we're looking for? And then, yeah, multiple. It's just a due diligence process, so you'll – uh, obtain research reports, find out historical track record, get more detail about the portfolio, um, understand their approach, and then uh, eventually meet the portfolio managers. I think that's key, and a key role of an advisor is to mm. you know, put the what do they say, press the flesh or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, which is much easier now. You know, if they're based, I think they're based in Queensland or Sydney. So being able to get on teams with the portfolio managers, and we've done it to managers in New York and. Europe as well. I think that's incredibly important when you're recommending things to, to clients. Yeah, for sure. And you can always jump on webinars and that sort of stuff if you're not being advised by an advisor, but that's that's a good way to do it. Um, okay, so that's the the Plato uh, Income Maximizer Fund. But there, there are many listed structures too, like outside of listed investment companies, we've got funds and we've got ETFs. Um, I'll just rattle off some of the, the most popular income focused funds and these are, this isn't an exhaustive list we've got the hvst etf from beta shares we've got the ihd etf vanguard vhy ymax which we covered separately in the q a session uh, dvdy mvb which is actually not an income focused fund but it's actually just the seven big banks grouped together in one fund um, but it's actually produced pretty good returns over the past five years uh, it's been a lot of the income focused funds um, then you got ZYAU from EDF Securities, which is an ASX 300 yield focused fund, and then RDV from Russell. So these are some of the, the bigger ones. There are others. Like you can, as we've talked about in the past, you can use a vanilla you know, market beta index fund to get yield focus. But these, the principal focus of these is to increase the yield that you would get from an Aussie portfolio. Yeah, and the ASX 200 is probably yielding about 4% or 39 thereabouts on average. So most of these yeah. be yielding in excess of 5 or 6%. Yeah, and that's and then many of them too, if they have the holding period, you will, they'll also collect franking credits along the way and pass those back. Yeah. Um, I guess just if we could talk maybe a little bit about the VHY ETF. I've talked a lot about it lately, the Vanguard High Yield Australian Shares ETF. Yep. 
it is by far the most popular Australian ETF for dividend investing. And I think you mentioned in one of the passive income videos that we did that uh, you use it for that yield focus for Aussie equities. Yeah, we do. I mean, a key driver of Vanguard has always been cost. So it's, I think the ETF's about 25 basis points. Yep. Um, yep. And they've got a pretty, uh, whilst, you know, the key thing you need to understand with these ETFs is they're, they're tracking an index. It's a specialized index, but they essentially track and rebalance towards that index. Whereas something like Plato or uh, I think it was DVDY is almost a, an active management sleeve that comes onto it. Mm -hmm. um, I think just the, transparency and the ability to not necessarily turn the portfolio over, but turn the names and exposures over a little bit more than other index driven strategies. One of the reasons why we've used it. Yep. It's also um, the Vanguard fund, which is a, a kind of, a, it's a good feature of it. it uses forecasts, analyst consensus forecasts for dividends. Yeah. Um, where that, there are what we call um, dumb beta ETFs. So these are ETFs that have some sort of strategy which is stupid in that it will end up in yield traps or it will you know own bhp right before it's paid a dividend uh, right before it's announced a cut to its dividend or own the banks leading up to the uh, covid crash and all of these types of supposedly yield focused funds end up with you know holding the bag on some value traps um, whereas this one uses forward-looking analyst estimates which helps it um, and it combines that with about 60 to 70 stocks which means that um, it's quite diversified as well versus some of the other. I think that's a bit of an advantage over the Vanguard fund versus the other funds in the list. Yeah, I was looking at the Plato website before and they call it naive yield, naive where yield, you're just yeah. buying the highest yielding stock historically, uh, yeah. which doesn't necessarily, which is more likely to find a yield trap. So there's plenty of companies that share price have fallen on the assumption, as you were saying, that analysts expect their dividends to fall and hence they'll be worth less. Mm. But their dividend looks like it's at 15% for the time being. So I think that's a key challenge of investing for income we naturally gravitate to the highest yield but uh having some sort of forward-looking input into that even if it's data driven which is what this benchmark does i think is incredibly important mm. there was um there some of these etfs do get quite creative especially these income focused etfs um like the dvdy etf um which is the uh vanek morningstar uh Dividend Yield Focus Index ETF, quite a mouthful. Um, this is an ETF that uses basically the proprietary research from Morningstar and yep. then combines it with, so it's got dividend yield focus, but a distance to default. So Morningstar has this thing, it's like equity volatility um, and financial strength to try and predict companies that are unlikely to they have weakness on their balance sheet yep. in the future. And then it combines that by trying to find quality dividend paying companies. And I think that's quite unique. It's a relatively small fund around $21 million, sorry, $70 million at the time of um, recording. Um, but it's a it's an interesting ETF, 35 basis points. And you get, you know, you get all of that research um, in a listed vehicle. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, and you can see the, chat, the differences in the top 10 holdings when you pull that up as well. So if you look at most high yielding uh, strategies, the top 10 holdings, you'd know every name. You could buy them yourself. Yep. Um, whereas looking at DVDY and you've got ASX, the, yep. the um, stock exchange provider, Medibank and APA in the top 10, which yep. don't, I know that's only the top 10, but um, I think below that is you get even more differentiation. Yeah. So one key thing, we manage direct equities uh, in-house. So one thing that's important to know is if you're adding this ETF, how does it overlay or how does it complement what you've already got? Are, yeah. you, are you just overweighting the same stocks or is it giving you some diversification, which this one looks like it does? Yeah. Speaking of Morningstar, uh, investors, if you do have a Morningstar.com membership, you can actually use that website to put two funds side by side and have a look at the different um, holdings and how they overlap. And there's also a free tool from Vanguard. Uh, if you go to Vanguard Tools uh, and you can do a fund compare and you can see the overlap in the top 10. Yeah. Um, but this is, yeah, this is an interesting one because it, it's only early days for it, but it's relatively low fee. It's a um, pretty smart ETF in the f sense of how it is constructed. Uh, you could probably say the same for the ZYAU ETF from ETF Securities. Uh, it's five-year track record. It hasn't been as impressive, but it holds around 40 companies. It's got the shareholder yield focus. It does something similar in that it's trying to find companies with sustainable yields. And this is to your point, the way they that way they measure that is so they've got the total shareholder yield is the, the total amount uh, per share distributed to investors combining both dividends and share buybacks um, divided by its share price so they're trying to find the yield and then how much is it paying out in dividends and how much is it earning 
to make sure that the dividends being paid out are funded by the profitability of the company, not by capital raisings and not by div- uh, uh, debt, basically. So debt net issue. shareholder returns. So exactly. What what you're really you're not just just buying it for the income stream. Otherwise, you're effectively buying a bond. Is yeah, what where you exactly. get no capital growth. So yeah, I think it's unique strategy. We've used this in the past as an over like an income overlay yep. uh, as well, and it kind of reminds me of. Uh, have you got the yield on that one? 4.4, so not significantly higher than the, the market, but it reminds yep. me of, I think I mentioned it last time, as a dividend aristocrats where yep. the, they basically inc- increase dividends for 25 years to be considered an aristocrat. But if you look at it now, most of them are only yielding 2 or 3%. Yeah. So it's not about that headline yield, but the growing cash flow behind it. Um, and I think when you're looking at companies that are buying back stock as well as dividends, it's can be reflective of that as well. The one that's interesting is, um, I don't know if you know it that well, but the HVST ETF or fund from BetaShares, it's the modified ASX 100 um, and it actually holds the A200 ETF there, Australia 200 ETF. And it basically uses part of the portfolio just to target the dividend yields that are coming up before the next rebalance. Yeah. And so this might be one, whereas an accumulator myself, I think, oh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's probably not right for me because... It's turning over the portfolio. There's probably going to be taxable gains in there. Um, but maybe if you are in that zero tax bracket, maybe it's something that you look for. I would throw a bit of caution here, though, that it does come with a fee load of around about 90 basis points. It's about similar to the Plato strategy. Yeah. So 70 versus, I think, Plato was 80 or the LSC was. Yeah. Um, and, I, I mean, it shows you the ability to, if you specialize in a single area, you can you can find an edge somewhere. Yep. And, I mean, part of this specialty is analyzing balance sheets to find out who's got the biggest franc credits um, and trying to buy those stocks before everyone else does and yeah. then sell them on the other end. Yeah. No, then, make, yeah there's sorry. that kind of unique um, thing about the Australian, the unique tax system we have where you get franc credit refunds. Uh, but when the dividend's announced, the stock price never falls by the franc credit, only by the dividend. Yep. And part of that's because a lot of global investors are the ones holding the, the stock, so they don't have value in those franc credits. And that's where things like HVST and Plato can can jump in there and, and boost returns. Mm. Just to past performance, not indicative of future performance necessarily, but the, Australia, the Plato Australian Shares Fund um, has returned around a total fund return of around 10.2%. And in, it's interesting, um, it's 10.3% returns per annum in income and negative 0.1% in capital growth. Yeah. So it gives you a sense of it's all coming from the income component of the fund. Yeah, and capital, obviously they're returning capital in the form of capital gains too. So it's kind of what you'd expect. If you're getting 10, you're probably happy though. Um, <laughs> oh, that time. Yeah, definitely. Well, to put it in context, you know, this modified uh, ASX 100, the HVST ETF from British shares is 2.66%. Yeah. That was my numbers. So um, I guess, that, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of chalk and cheese there, but maybe there's like, this is where an active fund actually does play, pay literal dividends um, to have that focus where you can take it and make it smarter. And as you said, build on that IP that they have. This is not an endorsement for Plato, by the way. It's just something that we've just come across. So, yeah. Yeah, I think completely right. Um, and I think it can be difficult to actively, you know, an active dividend paying strategy based on a benchmark, if that makes sense. So an active benchmark versus true active management. I think yeah. it's kind of, you almost need to be one or the other. You need to be just following an index or full active, yeah, which is probably the... And this is because it, I feel like it can get hard for some because if they're, if they're automating it, chances are someone else is or already automating that, that, that through through a quant strategy or something like that as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, every, every investor in Australia basically knows like dividend harvesting and how that works and how you target the next dividend payment. I mean, there's, you can go on market index, the website, and just go upcoming dividends if you want to. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's some, I think it needs to be a bit smarter than that and maybe that qualitative approach is where it comes in. Just one thing here. Um, I mentioned the MVB ETF before, which is this bank's ETF. It's very concentrated, seven positions. Um, would you ever consider, say, having like a diversified Aussie shares ETF, say like um, VAS, A200, STW, whatever, and then using the MVB ETF to get more exposure to financials, I mean, it's like thirty percent anyway. But unless I had a you know really high conviction view that the banks were mm. super undervalued, like 
I, I didn't have the view in March 2020, but this would be, you know, in crises, this would be the perfect perfect investment because everyone thinks the banks are going to go bankrupt, but they never do. They're yep. inherently supported by the government. Yeah. So I think if, yeah, if you're buying an ASX 200, you've already got 40% or 30 to 40% in financial. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to double overweight it. Mm. Um, I think perhaps if you've got a fully active portfolio where it may hold less exposure to the banks, then something like this may, yeah, might right. make sense. That would make sense because I was trying to figure out, I could just ask Van Eck, where this MVB ETF comes from. Like yeah. who is it targeting? Because the, the other thought that I had is like, say for example, I'm an act, active investor. You could say I also have my ETFs or whatever. But if I don't have own any bank stocks directly, yeah. So I was thinking maybe instead of trying to pick Combank or NAB or whatever, you could take a whole of sector approach and say, you know, I don't think bad loans are going to be as bad as what they say and um, in high interest rates will be better for the net interest margin and so on and so forth. Maybe you could take a tactical view with it. I think it's ge- uh, probably geared towards the more professional, almost stockbroker level where they'll have an entire sector. Yeah, right. View where they'll say, you know, the banking sector is undervalued. Our, our three, more of like a three to six month strict or tactical decision um, than holding it core alongside other things just because of the the additional exposure that you get. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, if you're holding or if your client's holding direct equities and you want to, they, they're underweight. So if you're holding direct equities, you're generally going to be underweight to the financials compared to the index, then you might add it um, as a, as a complement to, to increase your weighting that way. Mm. But it's hard to see it, yeah, with an A6200 next to it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the the final one, which we, it's probably worth mentioning, is the Russell Investments High Dividend Yield Australian Shares ETF. This is an ETF that has performed pretty well over time. And just to read out what it does, it seeks to track the Russell Australia High Dividend Yield in, or High Dividend Index. Uh, it's Aussie blue chip shares with a bias towards um, those that have a high dividend yield, but that also have a history of paying dividends dividend growth and consistent earnings. So it's basically just taking you know, historical patterns and saying what is likely to pay in the future and is it growing? Um, pretty simple strategy, but it has produced pretty decent results. And I think, again, what I've noticed from looking at these ETFs over the past few weeks is that, um, and over these few years, I should say, um, is that the more diversified funds tend to be more all weather uh, than those that are very narrow. Sometimes these rules on the Australian market can result in 20 stock portfolios yep. um, where the broader focus tends to yield better returns. I guess that maybe, if I could just riff on this for a second, it could be that you know, uh, six to 12 months ago, maybe 12 months ago, no one was really looking at energy as a, as a sector to earn yield. It was pretty unloved. And now all of a sudden it is the sector paying the massive dividends, right? And so having some exposure to those sectors through diversification is that what can give you that extra few basis Which points. Which kind of relies on that forward-looking approach as well. What you want in a dividend-focused strategy is a focus on companies that have got good cash flow. You don't yeah. want dividends like pre-GFC where dividends were being paid from higher gearing or from asset revaluations. You want them to be driven by increasing cash flow and you, know, mm. you have to have cash flow to really pay out strong dividends and to grow them. So, And you need a forward-looking approach to see that energy prices in the next, you know, energy stocks in the next six to 12 months or even associated stocks mm. are likely to pay higher than usual and consistent dividends for at least a period of time. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I'll ask you for your favorite in just a second, but um, have any of these ETFs, I guess, made their way in or out of your client's portfolios recently? Like, have you changed focus in the last few months at all? Like when you did your last investment uh, committee meeting, uh, were there any wholesale changes to Aussie equities or yield focus funds? Not to Aussie equities. They've kind of held up reasonably well. So n- no major changes. I was just running through a few updates for clients then where the mid cap strategies have kind of underperformed versus the vanguards and anything with higher commodity exposure, which has done well. Mm. We probably uh, removed, uh, so Plato, we've held it some at different stages, but it was removed pre pandemic when we kind of switched from an overweight to dividends to an overweight to growth mm-hmm. um, and benefit a little bit from that. So we kind of view it that tactically, not three months tacti- tactically, but, a, you know, if a year or two. Yep. Um, and there's there's uh, stats out at the moment that, that show it's something like when the majority of your returns come from capital growth for a period of 10 years, it's more likely that majority of your returns over the next 10 years will come from dividends. So it's um, becoming of interest again. Um, And particularly when 
generally Australian companies are pretty strong given we've been a beneficiary of everything that's yeah. happened in the world uh, somehow. That's interesting. So over 10 years, you've got that capital growth. I mean, it makes sense. Those companies then transition um, to paying dividends and dividend yields become a focus. I think that's what we're seeing now is people are relying on that income to protect their downside in many instances. They're yeah, relying definitely. on the BHP to pay its dividend, Combank to pay its dividend. And hopefully that underwrites some of the poor performance from the capital perspective that we've seen. And that's a consistent story in tough markets. So maybe not the GFC when dividends were cut initially in 2020, but during you know down or flat markets, just reiterating that you're still getting four or 5%, yeah, you're not getting the capital gains, but no one is during that period. So dividends can be a you know a consistent source of at least some return, mm. um, even if capital is going sideways in difficult markets. Mm. Um, okay, so question for you then is like of these funds that we've looked at today, which of those would be highlights to you or like worth uh, people putting on their watch list? Uh, Vanguard for sure, definitely. That's the boring answer. Yeah. Um, I hadn't. You've actually surprised me on a couple of them. <laughs> okay. So I don't mind uh, the DVDY. We we get Morningstar Research, and uh, they're inherently value oriented, as you probably yep. explained. So I kind of like how defensive and how conservative they can be. Mm. Um, and then the portfolio is a fair bit different to uh, a lot of other portfolios. So yeah, yeah. I like. Um, so I've only looked at Plato in the past, um, but I've known about. Don for quite a while because of his expertise. You've interviewed him, haven't you? No, oh, no, no. I I was going to, so hopefully I can have him back on the show and um, we can we can follow up with this conversation. But I do like Vanguard VHY for me is pretty rock solid. It's hard to go past, particularly if you're in accumulation mode. Um, there are other listed investment companies. Perhaps there's a full session on this, but there are many other listed investment companies that offer the franking credits plus growth um, that so many people would be looking at. And I guess I, I do like the Russell strategy as well. It's, I think it's got about 200, I've just off the top of my head, $250 million odd invested into it. Um, but RDV is another fund that I think is very simple in its design, but it's also quite elegant and it gives you that exposure for 34 basis points. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice and tidy there. Um, but yeah, for VHY for me, for accumulation, I do like, I think this is where we differ, where we had to chat about the passive income series about listed investment companies. I do actually like listed investment companies from the perspective of franking credits and capital uh, and smoothing and, and yeah, smoothing that capital gains bill. Yep. Um, so I do like some of them. Maybe we can do another session on them. But in the meantime, if you're looking for ETFs, I think VHY should be on a watch list. I'd be wary of some of the ETFs that rely on shorter term strategies like um, harvesting or derivatives. Yep. I just think it's probably for most people, I don't know if it's necessary complexity. I just think maybe they're more, and they tend to have higher fee loads because of that more active bend. And particularly in a more volatile market, I think. Yeah, yeah. I just think maybe just keep it simple for, for the yield focus. That's my two cents. All right, mate. Well, well that's our conversation, the, you know, the top ETFs and, and funds. We brought Plato to the table. Um, don't forget the beta shares EANC ETF as well for a watch list or fund, I should say. Um, but hopefully we can come back and we can talk about listed investment companies sometime in the future. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com/au. That's am.jpmorgan.com/au.